robots will cohabit our environments. And in building like an airport, a car park, or a warehouse, mobile robots can rely on wheels to locomote efficiently around on these flat terrains. However, there's a lot of people that work in environments like these. And it's where they have to do inspection of mines and sewage systems. They work in industrial facilities with stairs. Or even after an earthquake or natural catastrophe, rescuers go in um, in these buildings and put themselves into dangerous situations. Wouldn't it be great if we could help these people also with a mobile robot? It's in these environments where a robot with legs can relieve itself from the constraints that are posed by wheeled and tracked vehicles. A logic robot can go up steps and down, climb over obstacles, crawl underneath obstacles, and even go up and down stairs. In my work, I want to focus on the mobility of legged robots in rough terrain. And there are several key constraints that we have to take into account. The robot has to make contact with its feet on an intermittent basis, and has to choose stable foothold in order to locomote. It has to make sure it doesn't collide with the environment. And it has to all the time keep stability and make sure it doesn't collide with itself and keep joint and torque limitations. I'm going to structure my work in five parts. I'm going to start with the evaluation and modeling of run centers. So the robot has to perceive first its environment in order to understand it. When it takes these measurements, I'm going to look at terrain mapping where the robot takes sense out of this data and creates a map that is understandable to the robot. Then I'm going to look at how to control the robot. And now that we have a map and know how to control the robot, I'm going to look really how can the robot look into the future and see where it's going to step and find a safe path over those obstacles. And finally, I'm going to broaden the context and look at collaborative navigation of a flying in the wheeled vehicle to improve their navigation skills. I'm going to start up with the evaluation and modeling of range sensors. And here we're going to look at different technologies. And my goal is then to model and understand the errors and the noise that we get from these sensors. Because understanding the error means we can create high quality maps from this data. So looking at the performance criteria, here we have a robot with a sensor in front of it. And important criteria are measurements such as minimal and maximum range, horizontal, vertical field of view, but also importantly, the density, the number of points that we get out per measurement. We have to make sure the sensor works in sunlight. And like I mentioned, important factor is what is the resulting error when taking these measurements? I have evaluated four different sensor technologies, namely structured light, laser range or LIDAR, time of flight cameras, and assisted stereo cameras. In the following, I want to focus on the noise modeling of the Kinect version 2 time of flight camera. This camera works by strobing an infrared light onto the scene from which it is reflected back to a sensor. By measuring the phase difference, we can measure the time of light it takes each ray, and we can create the depth image for each pixel in the image. What I'm interested in here, shown for one ray, is the axial noise along the measurement ray at the lateral noise, which is perpendicular to the measurement ray. To do this, we have set up an experiment where we use a target at different distances in which we can rotate. And on the left, you see an image, a sample image of the resulting depth image. From the top view, we can use the angle theta to measure the target angle and alpha to model the sun horizontal incident angle. And in this view, you see how we measure the actual noise along the measurement ray. From the front view, we're interested in the lateral noise by looking how sharp can we recreate an edge of the target. Now, taking many measurements at different distances and angles, we get this plot uh, where we see how the noise increases over distance and over the target angle. The target angle is plotted on the horizontal axis and the noise on the vertical axis. And in colors are the different ranges where we measure that. So we came up with this um, empirical noise model, which very accurately predicts the noise at these different measurements. For the lateral noise, there's no such clear tendency, and we choose to model the noise as the 90th percentile. 
if we go out in sunlight, we see a different behavior. We're at more direct angles of the sun, we have higher noise. And we can understand this by looking at the Lambert cosine law, which explains the light intensity as the uh, sunlight incident angle, as the sunlight hits the target. And we introduce this additional term depending on the uh, sunlight angle alpha. Now we can see that the more we go outdoors from indoor, overcast, and direct sunlight, on the left hand side we see the axial noise and on the right hand side the lateral noise. And the more we go outside, the noise and sunlight is order of magnitudes bigger than indoors. And if we compare this to all the other sensors, we see a similar behavior. And we can say that for a range that we're interested in with a walking robot from one, two, three meters, the noise is in a range where it's acceptable in order to create the map that is useful. And we can also see that the noise deviates from very low to uh, high noise at distances such that we really need to take care of this noise in order to create the best quality maps that we can get. Looking at other measurement characteristics, this table can inform us how to select a sensor for our mobile robot and our use case. So in one example, uh, the prime sense, the first sensor, is really not sunlight resistant, so could not be used outdoors. Another important characteristic is the density and the rate of these sensors. We're all good, but there's one really lacking behind. And I'm going to explain that in the following example. Here's a top view of the robot, and you see the measurement points taken for one rotation of this LiDAR sensor. You see, in the close-up, it would take two seconds to cover a one-by-one one centimeter area. And for further away points, it takes up to 22 seconds to cover every cell. And this is in comparison to the... Uh, Intel RealSense stereo camera, where we get that many points and close up, up to two and a half thousand points per square centimeter, which probably more than we need. So we can approximate this noise I mean, with this model, which models um, depending on the surface normal and the distance from the sensor to the point, we can then use the inverse of this model to predict what is the ideal resolution that we want to run these sensors at. So for the real sense, in this case, we want to lower the resolution to a resolution of 312 by 234 to cover every cell at least once with one measurement. Now that we have understand these sensors, look at terrain mapping. And here the goal is to locally create the map, online, dense representation of the terrain from these sensors. We're going to model the terrain as a 2.5D surface map to represent the terrain. And importantly, we can only rely on proper receptive localization, which makes it much more robust because we don't need any absolute or external localization system. So let's imagine the robot on the terrain at times T1, and as it walks forward, it's now there. And we'd like to create the map. Now, in a classical view, sitting in the inertial frame from the outside, we know from experience and from literature that this proprietive sensing, which relies only on inertial and kinematic data, drifts over time in position and yawing angle. So here the position of the robot as it walked becomes more uncertain. Here depicted as the orange robot. Now if we do mapping straightforward, we create inconsistencies in the map due to that, which are a problem for planning. Now in my work, I propose to take a different approach and model the entire thing from a robot-centric perspective. Now we sit in the situation of the current time of the robot, and it knows about its position exactly, but the past position of the robot becomes more uncertain. And now if you do mapping, we see that in the front, the map is very clear, but the data that the robot has not seen for a while becomes more unclear. And we have, we can introduce these covariance boundaries, the upper and lower estimates of where we expect the real terrain to be. Now, formalizing this um, in my work, I have separated work in two parts, which is the data collection and the data processing. And I'm going to go through these steps. First, we have the range measurements. And for each cell where we have the measurements, we have to transform that to a height, which we can do straightforward from the range measurement um, vector and transform it to the map frame. And then use a simple projection mapping to get the vertical height of it. And for the error, importantly, what we want is to get the error of the cell resulting from the sensor measurement covariance, which we evaluated in the part one, and from the sensor orientation covariance on roll and pitch, which we get from the legged state estimation. 
Now, if there's an empty cell, we can fill in this data, but if there's already data, we're going to fuse new data with the existing in the sense of a common filter where we evaluate the new height as follows, and then we have also the new variance for the cell in this common filter, and we can create a consistent map. Now, this is getting the laser data into the map, and in the second part, I want to introduce the areas that we get from the robot motion. And we have to transform the height variance to a full 3 by 3 covariance matrix to do that. Then we can take the robot pose uncertainty from time k to k plus 1 and get the new cell covariance out by taking the old, the previous cell covariance, and taking this robot pose covariance updates from time k to k1. And the J's are here, the Jacobians, to do the proper error propagation mapping. Now that we have this 3 by 3 covariance matrix for each cell and the height, what we really want is to get the height and the lower and upper boundary. So we have to look at each cell individually, and I'm going to explain it with the following illustration. So imagine this is a profile cut from an obstacle from the terrain, and we sample now one point, and we look at the air ellipsoids and create a probability density function, which is weighted empirically based on the distance from this cell to the neighboring cells. Now, from this probability density function, I can integrate that up and create the cumulative density function, from which then I can sample the first and zero quantiles and from this, predict the maximum and the minimum height expected to be at this position. Now, I did this for one cell, and if I do this for the entire map, I can create this confidence bound. Now, the same view here in 3D, this is the original train on the left, and on the right, I've plotted these air ellipses from the top view. And if we go through all of these points, what we get is kind of like this smooth out terrain on the left for the estimated terrain. And here blue means that we're more certain about this sampling point, and yellow means we're less certain about it. And on the, in the middle and the right, you see the upper and lower confidence bounds, which tell us here is the maximum and the minimum expected terrain to be. And importantly, later we're going to choose, of course, the blue areas, the certain areas to step on, because there the robot knows, even though the train is uncertain, there's still certain positions where it can safely step on. Now here's the train mapping in two examples, uh, where it does real-time train mapping from the left-hand side to use the robot Starlet, indoor with a structured light sensor with a static gate. On the right-hand side, it's outdoor, complete different setup in a forest um, with a rotating lasering sensor uh, with a dynamic trotting gate on a robot animal. And in both cases, same uh, principle, but we see the difference in quality of the maps. Now, to analyze this more clearly, we have uh, that, done the following experiment. We have created a scene and then scanned it as a ground truth with this multi-stage where we trained the absolute uh, point cloud from the environment. And you see in the video how the robots walk through this environment, and in the front you see the current scan that it currently takes in comparison to the ground truth. Now, when evaluating this, this is a top view now of the train on the left-hand side. What we're going to do, we're going to show how this map evolves, and we're going to look at one profile cut and look at it from the side, in the right-hand side plot. So in the beginning, we see that the map, the estimated train, here plotted in blue dots, and the real train in the black line, they are very well aligned. But as the robot walks, we notice in the back that the train, um, the estimate starts to drift away, and in the final picture we see that there's quite an error between the estimated and the real terrain. However, uh, the method is shown to work because the true terrain lies well within the confidence bounds of the estimated terrain. So now that we have the mapping, I want to show you how we control the robot. And here my goal was to create a controller for the robust motion tracking of legged robots. And really to focus in on creating an interface which separates the motion generation from the control. So how do we control the robot? Typically we use an interface such as a joystick, computer screen, or we use motion scripts that we can replay in the robot. Or if we go one step further, we can create footstep planners or full motion planners to two complex motions. 
And then we somehow interface this with the controller, which does the real-time tracking of the robot. And here we see classic the state estimation, controller, and then in this real-time loop tracks the desired motion. But every time we create the new interface, uh, it's error prone and it's a lot of work. So I propose a universal interface for legged robot to control, which I call the Freegate API. Here this is a unifying interface where I define the motions by a sequence of not values. And in the second step, I can transition from the current state to the desired uh, motion and spline through these knot points uh, for trajectory generation. Then for the real-time control, we sample this trajectory uh, at the resolution that we need, and finally we get to the controller the state for the swing legs and the state for the base. I want to focus a little bit on this Freegate API, which is a very important part of this work. The Freegate API consists of two main motions. One are for the leg motion, which can be defined either in joint space or Cartesian space for the end effector, here shown for the red leg. And base motions, where I would define the position, orientation, and velocities of the torso of the robot, which then automatically mean that the legs that are in ground are determined through this motion. Now, there's different types I can uh, send this command in. One is a target where I simply send go to this position with your leg on the base. And then from a more complex motion, I can do full trajectories. And I've created this library with a set of automatic tools, which means I can send it a target foot location in the case of a footstep, and the robot will automatically figure out how to step there the best. Similarly, the base auto command means it generates a pose automatically given the current foothold situation such that all footholds can be reached, but the robot stands stable. Now, from these elements of API parts, we can mix and match our commands together. And here's a simple example of the robot walking. So it uses the base auto command to make sure the base is aligned correctly and then uses the simple footsteps to walk. It's another example where we use a joint trajectory and here it would turn around the leg and, uh, for example, change the configuration and use the end effector to touch something. So we can really, uh, with this tool, um, take these elements and parallelize them as we need them. Importantly, all these commands can be represented in an arbitrary frame, which is important for the task at hand. And with this tool, we've created an API for the versatile, robust, and task-oriented control of legged robots. And I'll illustrate this with the following example. Here, we ask the robot to do three-legged push-ups where one leg should stay in the air. And on the right-hand side, you see the motion script that we use to program this. So first, we use the base auto command to move the base to stable position. Then we tell it the right front leg should move uh, to 20 centimeter height in the footprint frame, which is defined between the legs. Then we simply ask with the base auto command to move your base to a height of 38 centimeters by keeping the leg at the same position. And then this motion um, of adapting the position occurs automatically. We move the base up and down here to 45 centimeters and then lift it again down in a straight profile type to the ground. So with these 35 lines of codes, I've already programmed the robot to do this complex motion through this API. Now, when working in real environments, it's important that I can track the robot's motion with respect to the environment accurately. Now, to show this, we've pre-programmed the sequence of footsteps here shown as blue dots on the ground in the world frame. And the robot is localized with respect to the world frame with the scan matching with the laser. And we're going to start multiple runs from different positions and show the result. We can see that after one step already, the robot steps onto the desired locations. And in repeating this from different positions, we can see that the motion converges very quickly. And even it's hard to see, but the person that pushes the robot, or later we use a pipe on the ground to diverge from the desired footsteps, um, so the motion can be tracked robustly, even under disturbances. We use this in several projects, such that um, in terrain that we know structured rough terrain, and here we see the robot uh, choosing from a set of templates to climb over obstacles, climb over gaps, 
and either it's known from the environment or the user chooses an adequate motion. Here, we rotate the legs to go over big obstacles. And finally, we can also climb very steep industrial stairs, which are steeper than 45 degrees. Now, since this is so flexible, we can go ahead and, for example, change the height to make the robot crawl. Or by changing its leg configuration to display the like, we can really go into pipes and uh, use this motion, the flexibility of the robots to achieve these maneuvers. Going one step further, we can do simple manipulation. And here we'd see the robot pressing a button of the elevator. And in this task, we used the April tab, which you see in the video, in order to determine the position and simply told that to the Freelight API, this is where we want the robot to push. Now, these are templated motions that, from which we can choose in the library. Of course, this interface is also meant as an interface for motion planning. And on the left-hand side, this work I've done with my student, uh, where we did kinematic whole body motion planning in order to climb these stairs. We can also do highly dynamic maneuvers on the right-hand side, where we see the robot jumping and rearing. Now that we know how to control the robot, our goal is to put things together and create a locomotion planner that uses the map and these control abilities to run over the train. The goal is to walk to that the system works in previously unseen dynamic environments and everything should be fully contained. So there's no external equipment and all the replanning happens in real time. This is the overview of the entire scheme. And I'm going to go through it step by step. So here again, we see the classical control group of state estimation whole body controller. And we've seen in part one and two how we use the distance sensors in order to create the consistent elevation map of the terrain. Then the locomotion planner takes the terrain data and the current position of the robot through run through a set of processes in order to create a free gate motion plan, which is then translated, uh, as we have seen in part three, to the whole body controller. And I want to focus now on the locomotion planner in this part. I'm going to go through it step by step. So when we get the elevation map, we can process this and check for every patch and figure out, for example, the surface normal, which will be important later. We can process it with different quality measures, such as slope, curvature, roughness, of course, the uncertainty in the terrain to create a foothold quality measure, telling us where is it safe and good to step out and where is it dangerous. And finally, we can create a three-dimensional sign distance field in order to do fast collision checking. Now, first, we want to generate sequence of steps. And here's a top view. On the left, we see the robot standing in an arbitrary configuration. And on the right, we see the goal pose. And the process works as follows. First, we interpolate a set of stances between the start and the goal. And then just move one stance ahead and choose the appropriate leg, which gives us the first step. In the next step, we do the same thing over again, interpolate, choose the next stance, and choose the second step. Now, if we do this, we can start, of course, from any configuration, which is nice. But also, since we do recomputation at every time, this motion converges to a skew between the left and the right legs, which is important for stability and speed during locomotion. And also, because we do recomputation every time, it's robust against deviation from the original plan. And finally, it's nice, this motion generation always ends up in a squared position of the robot. Now imagine the robot stands in, in front of this gap and the nominal foothold tells it to stand right there in the gap. So now our goal is to adjust these footsteps in order to uh, find a safe locomotion over the terrain. So we sample in a search radius all the candidates and we can categorize them. First we have train, we have footsteps candidates which are invalid from the terrain but would be actually reachable by the robot. Like here, the yellow ones. Or down there we have valid blue areas which are fine to step at but are not reachable by the robot. And finally, we have positions which are both valid from a terrain and a kinematics point of view. And we choose the closest point to the nominal as a adjusted foothold. Now, we have checked this kinematic reachability, but how do we do this? 
This is done in the so-called pose optimizer, where its task is given n foot locations to find the robot's base position and orientation that maximizes the reachability and stability. So in the image, uh, the goal is really given those red dots at the feet to find the robot pose position and orientation such that the legs can be reached and the robot is still stable. And we can formalize it as a nonlinear optimization problem, where in the cost function, penalize the deviation of the current setup for, to a default kinematic configuration as shown here, the difference between the foot and the foot in the default configuration. And then we can increase the stability by penalizing the center of mass deviation from the centroid of the support polygon, as shown in the support polygon with green dot. Now, to constrain the solution, we add two constraints, a stability constraint to make sure that the center of mass is within the support polygon, and the joint limit constraint, which makes sure that the robot doesn't, its legs don't overstretch or go too close. Now, we can solve this problem very efficiently as a sequential chaotic program in roughly 0.5 to 3 milliseconds on the onboard PC of Animal. On the left-hand side, you see a couple of examples, only given those footholds, how the optimizer finds these solutions which fulfill the kinematic and stability constraints. On the right-hand side, you see an interactive demo where I drag the foot around and the pose of the robot is automatically adapted. Now that we have the adjusted foothold, or in the last step, the goal is to connect the start and the target location with the shortest collision-free swing trajectory. And since we have parameterized our swing trajectory as a spline, we can optimize over these knot points. And we do this in a minimization problem where the goal is to minimize the path lengths while making sure we don't run into collision with help of a collision function, which is based on the sine distance field that we generated from the elevation map. And here we use this term to normalize it uh, through these collision fields. Now, here's an example where we have the terrain from the side and the robot standing on it. And we have a terrain with a low confidence bound. So typically, and then the sine distance field, which tells us how close we are to the obstacle. And then a typical solution in this case would be that the robot smoothly goes over the terrain, but is collision free. Now imagine we don't know that well of the terrain and the confidence bound is much higher, for example, for a hind leg. Then the collision field is bigger and the solution um, gives us a much steeper path trajectory of this swing leg, which is nice in an uncertain area where the robot would step much more carefully from top down in order to make sure it doesn't collide with the environment. Now, putting things together, we did a comparison with the blind reactive walking that we implemented. On the left-hand side, the robot walks blind, takes big steps, and has only to can feel the ground through the contact forces. And like we see in the success rate, we see that up to obstacles of 10 centimeters, this works well. Um, but if we go up to higher obstacles, uh, this is going to simply fail. That we also needed to ram to actually walk up on this obstacle. In comparison, on the right hand side, you see with active mapping, where the robot steps much more certain onto the obstacles and this actually takes the same step length, but is faster in the execution of the motion. And we have shown that we can achieve running over obstacles with up to 50% of the leg length. Now, in a little bit more complex scenario, we see here the robot walking over stairs, but we don't tell the robot that these are stairs. This is just an arbitrary terrain for the robot. And here we use the stereo camera in front of the robot in order to create this elevation map. And you see in blue are the areas which are valid to step on and white ones, the ones which are not. We clearly see that the map is not perfect. However, our framework can robustly track this motion. We're going to see in a second how the hind legs slip. But due to our replanning process, this is not a problem. And the replanning just continues from where it started. 
Since we have knowledge of the surface normals, we can feed that back to the controller and use the force controllability of a robot in order to constrain our reaction forces on the ground, such that the robot does not slip on inclined surfaces like these. The reactiveness of our approach is shown here where we throw stones in front of it and we see in the map up there how quickly the, the entire process reacts and since the replanning happens it can walk safely over these obstacles that have been uh, thrown in front of it. Here we show the robustness by pull, pushing and pulling the robot or changing the plate where it's standing on. And here it uses localization in order to navigate to a global goal in the room. And although we strongly disturbed it, the robot, the robot finds, generates the sequence to the goal location. And finally, this is to showcase the robustness of the approach where we walk over moving obstacles, over person, um, as a soft body, or even in a very narrow path. So this is framework is really shown to be flexible in all of these environments and tasks. So now we have a robot walking over rough terrain. I want to expand a little bit and show how we uh, did a work with the collaborative navigation of a flying and a walking robot. And here it's about to use their different abilities to create a, a bigger framework. The motivation is that from a flying viewpoint, I can very quickly, the robot can see the train from up top and fly very uh, fast around. However, it has limited sensing and payload capabilities and a limited operation time. On the other hand, I have a walking robot which has a rather low viewpoint and is compared to the flying vehicle rather slow. However, it can carry high payload and sensing and has an operation time which is much higher than the flying vehicle. Now this is the overview of the approach, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I'd rather demonstrate the complexity that has gone into this work with many of my co-authors. So it's really all these technologies bringing them together, and I'm going to show you the demonstration that resulted um, from this work. So here the goal was to go from a start location to a target location, where there's only one possible path and there's obstacles in between. So first we let the flying robot explore the environment and we see in the left bottom corner it creates a set of visual features which are then added in a simultaneous localization and mapping framework to consistent map. We, we can use the camera images to create with our elevation mapping framework a dense representation of the entire terrain. As these two maps are then transferred to the walking robot which interprets them. So here it looks at the traversability and then finds a global path from the start to the goal location. Then it starts tracking this, and while it goes, it uses another camera image which is on the robot to localize itself within the map that was created by the flying vehicle. We can see here how it matches those visual features from the current viewpoint in the global map. It updates the map continuously, and we have thrown an obstacle in front of it while walking. And since it updates, it replants the motion such that it can adapt to a changing environment. And then make it safely from the start position with help of the flying vehicle to the goal location. In conclusion, I have shown five contributions to the work in rough terrain locomotion with legged robots. First, I've evaluated different sensor technologies and showed them how they're applicable in mobile terrain mapping. I've modeled the noise for the Kinect version 2 time of flight camera, which is very important for mapping. And this work can be extended, this framework, to new sensors as they are released, and our knowledge about the the sensors can they, is applicable to other mobile robots. In the second part, I've shown a robot-centric formulation of an elevation mapping framework which explicitly incorporates the drift of the state estimation. We have open sourced the software which has been used widely by many other projects, for example, for aerial mapping, navigation planning, autonomous excavation, and co-localization through these elevation maps. 
for LEGO Control, I've shown a framework for the versatile, robust, and task-oriented control of LEGO robots. Similarly, our software has been used in many applications, such as the Argos Challenge, the ERL Emergency Challenge, and we have created automated ducking, and even made the robot dance where it listens to music and creates dance generation based on the music it hears. For locomotion planning, we have created a framework that enables a robot to cover rough terrain in realistic environments. And some of you might know these stairs. It's just outside this building where the robot, we took the robot for a walk in Zurich on stairs on a rainy day. So it really shows real world application of this robot in real world settings. And we walked up roughly 30 meters over a course of 25 steps. And lastly, I have put my work into a bigger context where I've shown a framework for the collaboration between a flying and a walking robot, where they utilize their complementary features as a heterogeneous team. With that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention.